This week, do thermometers affect your pineal gland and destroy your third eye? Some conspiracy theorists say yes. We'll read a quick article from the Discover magazine talking about just such a conspiracy theory. Then we'll explore the strange home of Aleister Crowley, bowl skiing. What exactly happened there? What of the 115 demons that he unleashed? What happened after not one but two tragic fires happened on the property, formerly owned by Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page? And finally, how can you go visit there today? We'll wrap the show up with a single card tarot draw and talk about the warrior poet. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 554. In the news, just want to say I hope to see you all at the South Pasadena Masonic Lodge Con event, three-day event happening this upcoming week. As you can guess, I have already recorded and uploaded the episode for next week because I will be busy all weekend at SPML or South Pasadena Masonic Lodge. I want to thank the producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners of the program. This show has been going strong for 10 years and we cannot do it without you. We couldn't have done everything we do without you. Every single dollar that comes into this program, we reinvest into things that make it better, that make you retain the information better whether that's adding music or any number of great things. In addition, it also funds additional projects of the WCY podcast. What kind of things? Well, things like the remastered Manly P. Hall lectures that we have developed. Things like Masonic Radio Theater. Things like keeping every episode, not just the latest 300 episodes, available to everyone all the time. We have no episode backlog that is exclusively available to certain people. In fact, all episodes are available all the time through the episode vault, which is free. So we just want to thank everybody out there who assists us in bringing this show to everyone. If you're curious on how to help the WCY podcast bring Masonic education to the world, head on over to wcypodcast.com and click on support the show. Additionally, we have things like the shop. Inside the shop, you can pick up our limited edition producer's pin. We also have a selection of other books and things that we have published over the last couple years. And, of course, some of you know that I do some handmade leather works. I have decided to offer a few small pieces that will be available to you to order, and they are customizable. Some handmade bespoke leather keychains and some other things. So those are all available to you, and all the dollars just go right back into the production of this program. If there's something that you want specifically that's not a keychain, well, shoot me an email. I might be able to make something for you. Just let me know. All right, now let's get into this week's education. I mentioned in last week's episode that we had a few things that we wanted to cover that were kind of peripheral, that didn't really tie into anything we were covering at the time, but nonetheless, things that are relevant to both Freemasonry and the occult sciences as well as things that fit into discoveries within the overarching umbrella of the seven liberal arts and sciences. So what are these things? Well, first up, I wanted to read this piece called The Myth of the Pineal Gland. And it comes from Discover Magazine, first published back in September of 2020. Among the many COVID-19 conspiracy theories, I recently came across one that's got an interesting neuroscience twist. The theory is that the infrared thermometers widely used to screen people for fever are actually designed to damage the brain's pineal gland with some kind of harmful rays. The theory is scientifically absurd, although relying on these thermometers is still not a great idea because they're inaccurate. But it's rather interesting from a historical point of view because the pineal gland is a brain structure that has long been linked to mysticism and conspiracy. The pineal gland is a pea-sized body located deep in the brain. Its main function is the secretion of the hormone melatonin. But it has often been ascribed much more mysterious significance. In the 17th century, René Descartes described the pineal gland as the point where the immaterial soul contacts the material body. 
building on the work of earlier philosophers who saw it as a kind of valve that controlled the flow of spirits within the brain. In the 19th century, the pineal was widely identified with the third eye of Hinduism and given much spiritual significance. It has even been suggested that the shape of the pineal is somehow reflected in the ancient Egyptian mystical symbol of the Eye of Horus, although personally, I don't see it. In the late 20th century, conspiracy beliefs involving the pineal arose, which drew on the reputation of the pineal as the Eye of the Soul. I believe that the first of these was the idea dating to the 1990s and still going strong. That water fluoridation is a conspiracy designed to damage the pineal gland and thus dampen the spiritual or psychic abilities of the population. Later, mobile phones and Wi-Fi were also accused of causing pineal damage. This argument rests on the unlikely idea that the pineal gland contains piezoelectric crystals that make it sensitive to electromagnetic waves. So the new thermometer pineal theory is just the latest variant of the idea that the pineal gland is uniquely fragile and that it's under attack by toxic elements of the environment. None of the pineal attack theories are based on good science, but their persistence shows that they resonate with many people. I think these theories have a psychological foundation in concerns about modern technology and its effects on our lives. The mystical pineal gland shriveling away because of fluoride or Wi-Fi could almost serve as a metaphor for the toxic effect of modernity on the soul. But while there might be truth in that as a metaphor, that's all it is. Again, this quick little article came from Discover Magazine, posted by Neuroskeptic on the 30th of September in 2020. Now, if you are interested in the idea of the pineal gland, the Masonic Roundtable, we did an episode all about the pineal gland, a whole hour talking about it. And I think we shed a lot of light on the mysticism of this mysterious and mystical symbol and anatomical part of your brain. If you're curious, it's episode number 384, and I'll put a link in the show notes. How many of you out there have heard that Aleister Crowley had a house on Loch Ness and attempted the ritual of the abramelon and then cut it short because he had to go help out McGregor Mathers or something along those lines? So this is kind of a true story, although it is known that perhaps there is no real translation of the abramelon that is legitimate, even the one used by Aleister Crowley, which is why maybe it didn't work. Or maybe it's because he didn't finish the elongated ritual. I came across this article and the subsequent follow-up recently while checking out some of this story. And here we go. Ruins of Aleister Crowley's Cursed House on Loch Ness for Sale. Now the house is also known as Bolskine House, but here you go. You can buy the ruins of Aleister Crowley's house, the crumbling manor on Loch Ness known as Bolskeen, where the wickedest man in the world spent years carrying out black magic rituals within its walls. The BBC reports that Bolskeen House, former home of occultist Aleister Crowley and later owned by Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page, is for sale. After a fire tore through the manor in 2015, though there isn't much left, the selling agent Galbraith said echoes of its former splendor are all that remain of Bolskeen House, the BBC article says, but added that there is an opportunity to restore it into an outstanding property. Alistair Crowley purchased Bolskeen for the purpose of conducting a ritual that required very specific architecture. The first essential is a house in a more or less secluded situation, Crowley explained. There should be a door opening to the north from the room of which you make your oratory. Outside this door, you construct a terrace covered with fine river sand. This ends in a lodge where the spirits may congregate. Bolskeen was the perfect location. The demons and evil forces had congregated around me so thickly that they were shutting off the light, Crowley wrote of his experiments there. It was a comforting situation. There could be no more doubt of the efficiency of the operation. Some believe those evil forces still linger. At Bolskeen, Crowley was said to have summoned 115 spirits, including Lucifer, 
The BBC wrote in an article about a film crew who experienced unexplained phenomena there while filming a documentary about Crowley. The occultist also embarked on a complicated six-month power-giving black magic ceremony called the Abramelon, but he was interrupted in the middle of the ritual by his Grand Master, the Head of the Golden Dawn, who called him to Paris. It is claimed Crowley didn't have time to banish the spirits he brought to Bolskine. The rites of Abramelon, the mage, require prior months of preparation, celibacy and abstinence from alcohol including, among much else, the summoning of the Twelve Kings and Dukes of Hell, the Scottish Daily Mail wrote. Crowley's subsequent orgiastic ceremonies and sacraments are too disgusting to detail in a family newspaper, but fatefully he was interrupted. Amidst all his chanting and the sacrifice of terrified cats and goats, the sorcerer was called away to Paris, and Bolskine folk believe he never got round to banishing the dreadful forces he had summoned to the house. While Crowley's activity certainly did help, Bolskine already had a bizarre reputation long before the great beast conducted his rituals there. The Bolskine Kirk once stood on the shady shore of Scotland's Loch Ness, where the manor is now. If the land is cursed, it may have begun with the church. According to historical writings, an earlier minister of the parish had to fend off pesky wizard who was reanimating the dead. In an account of the Kirk of Bolskine, Alan Dawson wrote that, quote, Thomas Houston, 1648 to 1705, was noted as having to contend with a notorious wizard and cruinaire Frasile, the Fraser crowner or maker of circles as wizards do, who had raised the bodies in a churchyard and Thomas had to make haste to lay them to rest again." End quote. Sometime later, the church is said to have burned to the ground during a sermon, killing everyone inside. When Bishop visited the old Kirk in 1762, he wrote that it was, quote, "...the poorest edifice of any kind I have ever looked upon, as is also the manse." The churchyard is quite open without any walls, where you see plenty of human bones above ground, and the floor of the kirk is overspread with them. Dogs are seen carrying away the human bones in their teeth. Soon after, Colonel Archibald Fraser built Bolskine House on the charred remains of the church. Colonel Fraser was a firm Jacobite, the Scottish Daily Mail wrote, but all the land surrounding his pocket had belonged to Simon Fraser, the 11th Lord Lovett, who flip-flopped once too often on the Stuart cause, and after the failure of the 45, was the last person in British to be executed by beheading. Bolskine House then was the equivalent of two jabbed fingers at the Lake Lovett. The house remained in the Fraser family until 1899 when they sold it to the then 23-year-old Aleister Crowley. Several tragedies took place during his time there. Quote, the black magician also took pleasure in the suffering that his sinister practices apparently brought to local villagers, the Guardian wrote, when a piece of the land was put up for sale in 2009. He bragged about how an employee of the Bolskine estate got drunk one night after 20 years of abstinence and attempted to kill his wife and children. The family of Crowley's lodge keeper, Hugh Gillies, also suffered a series of tragedies. First, his 10-year-old daughter died suddenly at her school desk, and a year later, his 15-month-old son died of convulsions on his mother's knee. In 1960, then-owner Major Edward Grant killed himself with a shotgun in Crowley's former bedroom. The housekeeper, 78-year-old Anna McLaren, had a premonition of the suicide. She had been alone picking vegetables in the garden when she heard a gunshot from the house. She went into the house, but there was no one there. Seven days later, though at about the same time of day, she found her boss dead. Quote, I went in and found him with most of his head blown off, she recalled. The family dog was playing with a bone. Police told me later the bone was part of the major's skull. A young couple later moved in, the wife was blind, and within a few months her husband abandoned her there. Filmmaker Kenneth Anger spent the summer of 1969 in the house. During that time, he witnessed a heavy painting float off the wall and come to rest on the floor. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin bought the house the following year. In a January 1975 Rolling Stone interview, the interviewer said, quote, You live in Aleister Crowley's home. 
Crowley was a poet and magician at the turn of the century and was notorious for his black magic rites, end quote. Page was fascinated by Crowley, but he was interested in the house for the rest of its history as well. Strange things have happened in that house that had nothing to do with Crowley, Page responded in the interview. The bad vibes were already there. Page, who spent no more than six weeks at Bolskine throughout the 20 years he owned it, asked his childhood friend Malcolm Dent to move in and restore it. Jimmy Page caught me at a time in my life when I wasn't doing a great deal and asked me to come up and run the place, Dent told Ivernus Courier in 2006. I never did establish why he fixed on me. Dent lived at Bolskine for a long time and raised his family there. All the main rooms look out across the lock and you're 300 feet up, so you have some dramatic views, he said. We loved living there. It was a great house to raise children in and they loved it there in spite of its history, and in spite of the peculiar happenings that went on there. Dent knew nothing of the Bolskine's history or Crowley when he moved in. I arrived a total skeptic, to a degree, I still am, but there are things at the house you can't explain, he said. Quote, a girl who stayed for the night awoke screaming that she had been attacked by some kind of devil, the Scottish Daily Mail writes. Another night, Dent was roused by what sounded like a wild animal clawing and snorting by his bedroom door. He dared not open it till daybreak. There was nothing there, but whatever was there was pure evil." End quote. Doors would suddenly spring open as if someone was running through them, and slam in the middle of the night, and rugs would be found piled up the following morning. We just used to say that Alistair was doing his thing, Dent said. One of the most famous stories is that the head of Simon Lord Lovett, beheaded for treason following the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, can be heard rolling around the floor at Bolskine, the Ivernus Courier wrote, even though the house dates only from the 1760s. At the time of his death, he was supposedly casting his mind back to the heart of the highlands, Dent explained. Just above us is Erogi, which is the geographical center of the highlands. The nearest consecrated ground is Bolskine. Another story that Dent says everyone loves involves seven chairs Page bought from the Café Royal in London. Quote, Jimmy got those chairs specifically because one of them had Aleister Crowley's name on it, Dent said. Each of the chairs belonged to a famous person and had a nameplate on the back and front. Mary Lloyd, Billy Butlin, James Agate, Rudolph Valentino, William Orpin, and Jacob Epstein. Dent says Crowley's chair was always placed at the head of the table. But after the chairs underwent repairs, they kept finding Crowley's chair switched with Marie Lloyd's. The kids couldn't have done it. We didn't know why this was happening, Dent said. Then I realized the guy who did the repairs didn't know which plaque went with which chair and hadn't put them back on the right ones." End quote. But according to Dent, the strangest thing about the house may have been its visitors. Quote, I had them from every corner of the world, he said. A lot of them were nutters. A lot of them were downright dangerous lunatics. They still would be turning up today. The house is on the map as an occult center, and you're not going to get rid of Crowley's legacy that easily." End quote. Jimmy Page sold Bullskeen to Ronald and Annette McElvery in 1992. The couple turned it into a guest house. They despised any mention of Crowley and insisted nothing unusual ever happened there. Locals say that the McGilveries tried to erase Crowley's presence, whitewashing the interior and covering the stone floor with carpet to hide the magical symbols painted there. Their efforts failed several times. Villagers claimed alleging the symbols would reappear as the paint dried. While filming a 2000 BBC documentary called The Other Loch Ness Monster, a priest and a minister blessed the project. The clerics were called in to keep the crew safe, just in case. Still, they experienced their share of unexplained happenings. The film crew working on the BBC documentary were attacked by a plague of beetles, suffered repeated equipment failures, and experienced strangely similar nightmares about Crowley, the Sunday Mail wrote. Photos taken at the graveyard just down the hill, where a rumored tunnel from the house was said to lead, were ruined by a quote-unquote strange circle, a halo of fog, according to producer Gary Grant. It wasn't lens flare or the fault in a camera, he said. I'd never seen anything like it before. In another incident, lights exploded, fuses burned out, and camera stands fell over during a late-night shoot in the graveyard. 
showering the crew in glass. One crew member's phone kept ringing intermittently, while another's alarm clock would go off at the same time every day. The McGilveries sold Bolskine in 2002 to new Dutch owners who used it as a vacation home. They were not there on December 23, 2015 when a fire scorched Bolskine, leaving nothing but the external walls by the time the firefighters arrived. They determined that the fire began in the kitchen, but the cause was never identified. Today the burned out ruins are all that remain of Bolskine House, the shell of Aleister Crowley's unholy home and nearly 23 acres of cursed land on Loch Ness can be yours for 510,000 pounds. How about that? A very interesting look at this occult home. Now an update was published and the update is called Bolskine Rocks for Sale. Own a piece of Aleister Crowley's house. This was published on January 7th, 2020. It says, You can now own a piece of the Bolskine house where occultist Aleister Crowley carried out some of his most wicked black magic rituals. Rocks and charred remains from Aleister Crowley's house are for sale on eBay, and you're probably going to want them for your cabinet of curiosities as much as I do. Bolskine House, little more than a charred ruin today, was owned by the wickedest man in the world, Aleister Crowley, at the turn of the 20th century. There, he conducted numerous black rituals which some believed left Bolskine cursed. It has long been said that many of the 115 spirits Crowley claimed to have conjured, which included the 12 kings and dukes of hell, as well as Lucifer himself, are lurking within the walls of Bolskine. A fire decimated the house in 2015. It was put up for sale in 2019, but just after it was sold, another fire destroyed the last remaining wing. Quote, the house which overlooks Loch Ness was bought by Keith and Kyra Reddy last summer, and two days later it went up in flames. The Herald Scotland reports. They had no insurance. But Bolskine may still see new life. Keith and Kyra formed a not-for-profit Bolskine House Foundation with the goal of restoring it to its original design and opening it up as a spiritual retreat. The Ivernus Courier reports. To raise the estimated 700,000 pounds needed for renovations, the group has been accepting donations through their website and crowdfunding platforms. And now, they've really upped the ante by offering actual pieces of Bolskine for sale on eBay. The eBay listing reads, you are purchasing the original stone of up to 400 grams and one bag of charred remains from the fire on July 31st. 2019 from Bolskine House. Obviously, I bought one. The Cult of Weird collection would not be complete without an authentic chunk of cursed Crowley House. Maybe they'll throw in one of the Dukes of Hell for good measure. Now, if you want, you can visit the bolskinehouse.org website and it appears that the home is in full swing and they are open for tours actually. It is looking pretty good. Uh, you can check out the page bolskinehouse.org. And of course, if you are looking for pieces of the Bolskine House, you'll likely have to search all over eBay. I couldn't find anything uh, that was still available, but interesting nonetheless. Now, I'd love to wrap it up this week with a quick tarot card draw. As usual, my disclaimer on the tarot card segments of the program are that we'll be using these as a uh, contemplative piece to look at our own internal psychological process. And so what I mean is, just like a Rorschach test, we're going to pull a card, we'll see what it means using a traditional meaning, and then we will extrapolate that to look at what it means in a practical way for you today. We'll see if it aligns with things that you might be working on or things that are happening in your life. And then let's look at perhaps how that ties into Freemasonry and what Masonry can tell us about those situations. So uh, the tarot deck that I'm using is an unnamed deck, but it's got some cool artwork and I'm just going to give them a quick shuffle. Tarot has nothing to do with Freemasonry, although it does have an ability to assist us in contemplation, which is what we're really called to do in Freemasonry. We're told to think about how we act and all of these things, and then to use our Masonic working tools to affect our psychological process in order to make you, make us, better people. 
thereby affecting our families, communities, and the world around us. Is there a way or a number of times that you're supposed to shuffle? I don't subscribe to anything in particular other than to uh, just kind of clear my head of intent and just shuffle like you shuffle uh, your normal deck of poker playing cards, which are also tarot decks as well. So, uh, let's go ahead, give these a quick... Oh no, I, I dropped a few cards, now I have to reshuffle. Okay, continuing on, shuffling, cards back in hand. All right, just gonna take one card right off the top. The rest of the cards I'm going to slide back into my leather tarot card sleeve. Interested in one of those? I can make you one. All right, I'm gonna flip the card over and see what we have. The Knight of Cups. You know, traditionally this card is a knight that's riding on a white horse. In the hierarchy of cards, he is third in command. So you have the king, the queen, the knight, and the page. Just very similar to a 52 card playing deck. You have a king, queen, and a jack. Well, in this instance, you also have a page. But the knight is the same as a jack. So the knight of cups is a uh, kind of a romantic card, right? The cup is usually considered a feminine type of receptacle for holding fluids and, and those kinds of things. Now, the knight in this case is caring and in touch with a feminine side. So think about Alexander the Great, the warrior poet, a glass of champagne, writing some poetry, and being a general uh, sort of renaissance man. In this particular card, it's also a card that represents somewhat of a imagination. And the fact that the imagination is tied to a card that is leading towards a hierarchy leading up to king, the card has an intent, right? More than an idea, now it has an intent. Maybe the idea is tied to something like the page. Then the intent is formed in the night, and then it is happening with the divine feminine cards such as, you know, a queen or an empress kind of card, and then finally culminating in the king, who is also not just the master of the thing, but he might also be beyond the mastery to a point of observation, uh, if that makes any sense to you. The Knight of Cups, the way we've drawn it, was upright, so in this, he's looking at ideas of compassion, ideas that he is understanding toward others, because again, he understands his own type of psychology, if you will. He's in touch with his feelings and his emotions. A famous saying about this card is that the Knight of Cups is in love with love. This card might be telling you that you have a lot of creative outlets available. Again, thinking about the imagination and moving towards the creation of something, perhaps art, or maybe you're learning a new lecture or you're drawing a rendition of a tracing board, or perhaps you're writing down the initial phases of something that you might be called to do for the lodge or maybe just in your general community. The card generally is telling you also that uh, perhaps you've got some ideas of things you want to create. You might be thinking to yourself, uh, who am I to take that on? But this card is telling you that it's okay to explore the energy that you have for these massive undertakings, perhaps. It also says that it's a reminder to shoot for the stars. Because if you don't try, you'll never do. So you should do. And what's interesting is this card re is represented in the version of the tarot that I have as an astronaut. And as we kind of wrap up the idea of the, the Knight of Cups, remember that knights are typically like you watch a movie about a knight or the archetype of a knight. They're always out taking care of something that the king has asked them to do. They're on missions of humanitarian causes, or maybe they're in search of an archetypal grail. What this says for you also is that perhaps you are someone who makes your decisions 
based on your emotions that you kind of wear on your sleeve. Again, you are a lover of love, so you are always acting from the heart. It's pretty intuitive. So go with your intuition. Now, Masonically, we think about intuition as something perhaps you could tie to one of the four cardinal virtues. Temperance, prudence, justice, fortitude. I think I might place intuition in a camp with prudence because it calls us to think strategically. And what is intuition if not a almost psychic sense of intuition or a psychic sense of what will happen next? For a Craftsman Plus, I'll post a picture of the card in the Craftsman Plus Facebook group. And then also let us know what you think about Bowl Skeen House. Would you go there on a retreat? Perhaps would you be interested in a group retreat? A WCY group retreat? at Bolskeen House and on the Loch Ness. Anyway, that's it for this week. I'll talk to you all next week after South Pasadena Masonic Lodge's Masonic Con event. You can go to MasonicCon.com for more information on how to get tickets. And one last time before we leave, I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners for assisting with the production of this show. Thank you so much for everything. I want to thank the people who continue to share the show with their lodges, their brothers, their friends and family. It all helps spread quality Masonic education and also education based on different occult and kindred sciences. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. Yeah.